Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. And um, in the next few videos, we're going to focus on the introductory aspects of neurophysiology. In this video in particular, we will take a look at some um, definitions of potential energy versus kinetic energy. Some of these things you kind of know, but maybe not uh, enough to where you can easily apply them. We'll talk about Ohm's law. Uh, we're also going to learn about how the length and the width of a vessel will impact resistance, uh, which plays an important part in how well axons can conduct um, electricity. And a few more definitions, such as uh, voltage, current, things like that. So let's get started. So by now you're familiar with the terms potential energy and kinetic energy, right? And we tend to abbreviate them as E subscript P, E subscript K. Often I would imagine that in your introductory courses you've, ref you've referred to kinetic energy as the energy of movement. Uh, potential energy you can envision, for instance, an example where your pen is sitting on the edge of your desk and um, it's not quite falling off your desk, but it's sitting there with the potential of being able to start moving, right? So when it sits there, it has potential energy. But the moment it moves, now we're dealing with kinetic energy. But really, what does this all mean? Well, potential energy is best described as the amount of energy that we need in order to keep opposite charges or opposite charged particles separated from one another. So if we apply this now to our body, let's say, um, because that's what we're going to be discussing uh, in this class, obviously. Um, so let's say that this right here, the simple line represents our cell membrane, any cell membrane, right? And in the body, we're going to be focusing on the charged particles called ions. And ions can be positively charged, right? Or ions can be negatively charged. Now, indeed, there are such things as electrons, which are charged particles as well. And they're responsible for generating um, voltage and electricity. This all will become clearer here in just a moment outside of the body, let's say, in, in the cord that you plug into your wall so that your TV will work, right? Um, in the body, we do not have electrons that are responsible for generating our action potentials and graded potentials that you've learned about in muscle physiology, all right? It is actually ions, positive and negatively charged particles called ions. So keep that in mind. It's not electrons. Okay. So when we have this cell membrane boundary, keeping our positive ions separated from our negative ions, that requires energy. And that is what we refer to as potential energy. Now, in neurophysiology, even in muscle physiology, in AMP in general, we will rarely refer to this as potential energy. And we'll just refer to it as the voltage or I like to use the term potential difference. And we express the, the amount of energy that is needed to do this um, in, in a unit that has as its base unit the volt, or one volt, I should say. So one volt is the base unit. But in the body, we tend to use millivolts. And so one volt, the base unit, is equal to a thousand millivolts. Remember, milli always refers to thousand. Think of the word millennium, which is why, <clears throat> which means a thousand years, right? Which is why one meter is a thousand millimeters, which is why one liter is a thousand milliliters, one kilograms is a thousand grams, and on and on and on. Or um, where else can we apply this? I, I'd better stop because we can go on and on and on about that. Okay, so that explains now potential energy. Now in the body, we know very well that the cell membrane is just jam packed with all kinds of ion channels, right? So these are my little symbols for ion channels. And if these ion channels are open or triggered to open, then our 
um, ions can be start moving to the side of the opposite charge, right? So positive ions are attracted to the negative side of the cell membrane and vice versa. So now we see that there is energy freed up when opposite charges begin to meet. And this is what we refer to as kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is the energy liberated when opposite charges meet, which happens when we allow for the cell membrane to open up ion channels, or there are ion channels that are always open. Remember, those are your leaky channels. Now, here's another very important definition, and that is the term current. So a current refers to the flow of charged particles. So in our body, a current is going to be defined as the flow of ions. In the electrical cord that you use to plug in your computer, monitor, whatever it is, your flow of charged particles is going to be electrons, right? In living organs, it's always going to be ions. So that is what we refer to as our current. And a current is expressed in something called amperes. Now, we're not easily going to use amperes, that unit, in our dis future discussions. Uh, we will mostly talk about the amount of energy that is needed to require uh, or to keep charged particles at opposite sides of a boundary. So we will focus primarily on uh, voltage. All right, so now that we're more have a better understanding, I, I should say, of um, voltage, which we're going to abbreviate with the letter V. And in our body, we'll use the um, unit millivolts. And current is expressed in amperes. Like I said, we're not as easily going to use that unit, um, but still, we will talk about current. And then we're going to need to throw in a third parameter and that is called resistance. And we will abbreviate that typically with the uh, capital letter R while current is abbreviated with the capital I. And resistance is expressed in an, another unit called ohms. So amps and ohms will not use those units a whole lot, but we will talk a lot about these three parameters, particularly since they um, play a very important role in electricity um, and, how, and, and um, our understanding of, of how action potentials and graded potentials work in the body. Now, resistance, what are we really referring to here? Well, all these ions, right, they need to be able to move not just across the boundary, but also within an axon tube or a uh, we can even apply these parameters believe it or not to blood vessels in that case we're not talking about electricity but blood pressure um, as you'll see in amp2 and there in any tube that is filled with some kind of a fluid the particles on the inside as well as on the outside, are going to experience some form of friction, right? By rubbing up against the wall, basically, of the vessel, whether it's the axon or a nerve vessel or a blood vessel, even a lymphatic vessel, right? Lots of different vessels in our body. And so that is what we call resistance. Now, resistance can be expressed as as a constant, which is just a, a, a solid number, multiplied by the length of, a, of the tube or the vessel, divided by the cross-sectional area of that tube. What does this all mean? Well, for one, it's not as important for you to memorize this formula as for you to understand what it really means realistically. <laughs> 
So let's try to explain this. So let's say that, um, let me use blue so you can see it better. So let's say that we have um, two axons. One is kind of narrow, like this. And the other one is the exact same length. But notice that it has a much bigger cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area, what does that mean? Let me try to use a different color. Let's say yellow. So the cross-sectional area is this area right here. Right? So clearly this one has a larger cross-sectional area. And we don't need to worry about the length of the tube in my example because the length of my two tubes is identical. So the only difference that we need to worry about when we're now comparing resistance in these two tubes is the cross-sectional area. Well, the cross-sectional area is larger in this tube and therefore your particles on the inside are not going to experience as much friction because the chances of them running up against or rubbing up against the wall are slimmer, right? Think of a, a, um, um, a huge riverbed and compare it to a much narrower um, ditch. You know, in the ditch area, the chances of water molecules and whatever else is floating in there of hitting the bank uh, or the banks of the river of the ditch are much higher than in a big river, right? So you have much less resistance um, here. So resistance is lower here than in that one. But keep in mind, we're we're keeping the length of the two vessels the same. Otherwise, we'd com be comparing apples and oranges. Now we can do another comparison where we are going to have the same diameter. And I'll attempt to draw the same diameter, but one vessel is much longer than the other vessel. Oops, I should have. Um, hold on, just give me a second here and let me redo that. So this one is much shorter. And so let's just say let's say they're the same, right? The diameter is the same, or same cross-sectional area, I should really call it. Again, this is really important stuff for AMP2 as well. So if you get this now, your life in AMP2 will be so much easier. I promise you. Now, if we compare these two guys, meaning if we ask ourselves, where is the resistance higher, then it would be this vessel. Because of its length, the chances of particles hitting and rubbing up against the wall are much higher because it's just longer, right? So that is what you need to get here, that the cross-sectional area plays a role and that the length of the vessel plays a role. But you're always needing to keep one of these two constant, otherwise you can't compare the two. Of course, in real life, we have all kinds of different um, cross-sectional areas and lengths of vessels, but if you get this base, get this basic principle I just explained of length versus cross-sectional area, we're in good shape. And down the road, perhaps, you will actually really use this formula. I'm not going to ask you to do that ever. I would, I do need for you to know, you know, when you have this situation, where is resistance the highest versus this situation, where is resistance the highest? Okay, so I'm hoping that you understand this. So this is a big discussion about resistance, but resistance is going to impact um, our current and therefore um, um, the whole principle of electricity as well. So we had to have these lengthy discussions earlier to finally better understand Ohm's law, which is your very basic um, formula for that that really lays the foundation of the principle of electricity. Let's put it that way. And it's a simple formula. It says that I equals V over R. So I equals V over R. And if it's hard for you to understand the way it's typed here, um, you know, just rewrite it 
in handwriting where it says i equals v over r. Right, and you can rewrite this obviously because you can now isolate voltage and say, oh yeah, voltage therefore, basic algebra, right, must be equal to I times R. And remember what I means? Do you remember what it means or what it stands for? I represents current, don't forget. V represents your voltage or your potential energy, right? And then R represents resistance, easy to remember that one. All right, and so you should be able to play around with this formula as such. The other thing that you should be able to play around with is the following. Let's say that I told you, okay, let's keep resistance constant. It's not changing, right? So how does that, um, and, and, let's, and, and also let's say that we increase voltage. What is the ultimate result for the current? How does that impact our current? Well, if we keep this constant and we are now increasing voltage, clearly that is going to therefore increase our current. And now you can play with changing each one of these parameters yourself. So play around with this. You can maybe increase resistance while keeping current uh, constant. How does that impact voltage? So those are the kinds of things that I need for you to be able to do. So that's playing with a bit of theoretical math, but for you to visualize this better, I'd like for you to um, play with the example that I've listed here in your mind. So imagine that you, you know, you lived off the grid and you had a nice pressurized tank in your huge, on your acreage to water your um, garden with all its, of its pretty little vegetables. Um, well, you have your hose hooked up to that pressurized tank and of course, you may at times want to control how much water comes out, um, how fast it comes out, and so on and so on. So you can play with three parameters, and these parameters are equivalent to the parameters that we just discussed, current, voltage, and resistance. So the current would be equivalent to the flow rate of your water. How fast is it flowing? The voltage would be equivalent to the pressure in the tank. And then the resistance would be equivalent to the diameter of the pipe size, uh, to the, the diameter of your pipe or your hose, I should say, right? So let's say that we apply our example that we did earlier with our theoretical math. And that is, let's say that we keep resistance constant. So we only have one hose. All right, it's the same hose we use day after day after day. Okay, good. We're not changing the, the diameter of the hose whatsoever or the length of the hose even. But let's say that we have a way to increase the pressure in our pressurized tank. I think you can visualize now better how that would impact the flow rate of the water, right? If you crank up that pressure and you have, you're just using the same hose day after day, that is clearly going to increase your flow rate. And again, I want you to now play this game a little bit more and always do the following. You keep one of these parameters constant, you change one of the parameters, you increase or decrease it, and then ask yourself, how does that impact the third parameter? So create these scenarios over and over and over again in your head, apply the formula, but also visualize how that happens or what the consequences are um, in your, on your little farm there or wherever you're using your example where you're trying to water your garden, okay? Okay, so that was a very, very basic introduction to the basic principles, um, that's a bit redundant, but to the principles of, of electricity and um, we're now going to have to 
try to apply this to what happens in our body. What happens in our body when we receive a stimulus and suddenly phew, via the sensory neurons, that stimulus is now this electrical signal that literally flies into our central nervous system, either the brain or the spinal cord, possibly both. Um, or how from the central nervous system, this, this um, electrical event suddenly flies way down motor neurons to where, towards our effectors, whether they're muscles or glands, and make these muscles contract or make the glands secrete, right? So that's what the whole point is of what you were just introduced to. So we're literally going to apply what you just learned to graded potentials and action potentials on cell membranes. So there's a few things to really, really make sure that you have clear in your head. As I mentioned earlier, in our body, the charged particles are ions. They're ions. They're not going to be um, electrons, all right? So the charged particles are ions. Do we have electrons in the body? Yes, we do, but they're not responsible for creating the electrical events of the muscles and the nervous system. Also, the currents that are creating created in us um, as our ions are flowing, they run parallel to our boundary, which is our cell membrane, and important on both sides of the membrane. So not just on the inside or just the outside, but simultaneously on both sides. It's almost as if you're trying to visualize water following some kind of a boundary um, and the water flowing on either side of that boundary in the same direction. All right. Now, not only can ions flow along the cell membrane on either side of the cell membrane and create a current that way, which would be more of a longitudinal current, but as you know, ion channels could open and now ions can travel across the cell membrane. Um, and so that is, a, that is yet a different um, type of current and we'll, we'll look at these impacts. And then, as I mentioned um, from the beginning, your cell membranes themselves are actually the ones that create resistance. So anytime there is some form of a boundary that charged particles have to um, rub up against or cross, then that boundary functions as a form of resistance. And therefore that's going to impact Ohm's law, right? It could impact um, the results of that formula. So that wraps up our introduction to neurophysiology. We're going to uh, move on in the next video by reviewing ion channels one more time and adding some more ion channels.